On January 27, 1838, a 27-year-old Abraham Lincoln delivered an address at what amounted to a boys' high school. His speech was titled, The Perpetuation of Our Political Institutions. Demonstrating the prophetic wisdom he would later wield as the nation's 16th president, Lincoln said, Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never! All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined, with all the treasure of the earth, our own accepted, in their military chest, with a Bonaparte for a commander, could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point, then, is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up among us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Less than 25 years later, the nation was torn at the seams in a bloody civil war. We emerged from that conflagration stronger than before. But 160 years after Lincoln's ominous prediction, it seems to be coming true before our very eyes. Is America committing suicide? Stay tuned as we get an answer from another prophetic voice. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Nathan Jones and I are going to take a pause in our Jesus in the Old Testament series to discuss a book that is as important as it is timely. And we're delighted to have here as our guest today the author who is none other than Dr. David Reagan, the beloved founder of Lamb and Lion Ministries. Dave, we're so glad you're here. Good to be here. Thank you. Dave, this is an excellent book. I actually read the whole thing in one sitting. It was such an easy read. And I love what Tim quoted when he did the speech with Lincoln. And Lincoln, even though he was in the middle of a civil war leader, he seemed to be kind of despondent. But at the same time, he was so sure of the perpetuity of the United mm -hmm. States in the future. Yet in the speech, he talked about the threats being from external. He talked about uh, danger springing up amongst us and that America would only die by suicide. Do you believe that Lincoln's predictions for the United States are coming true? Yes, I do. And that's why I titled the book America's Suicide. And I, I, I did that because I believe that we have abandoned the pillars of American society. One of those, of course, is morality. Uh, the fact that morality that is based upon God's Word, because morality that is not based upon God's Word is just man's morality, and it, uh, that's not very good. Mm -mm. You, you go back to the days of the judges when every man did as he pleased, and you had absolute chaos, which is what we have today. But one of those pillars is morality based upon Christianity. Another of those pillars is our capitalist uh, economy, which gives great freedom. Uh, a third is the educational institutions of our nation, which have been taken over by socialists, uh, progressives, uh, liberals. And the uh, fourth that I would mention is the family. And you might notice that the progressives are very aimed at the family. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement. If you go to their website, you will see that one of their, one of their uh, items on their list of objectives is to destroy uh, the nuclear family, mm -hmm. which is their term for the godly family, the biblical family. Uh, so, these are the pillars that this nation was based upon. And in the first chapter of this book, I talk about America's Christian heritage. And I point out that over and over, all of the founders of our nation pointed out that this constitutional representative type system could not exist except on a moral basis where there, there is a common morality based upon Christianity where people have a moral feeling toward their lives and toward their government and operating in a responsible manner. And if ever that disappeared, the Constitution would collapse. And that's where we are. Yes, it certainly is. You know, Dave, one of the, the quotes you did not cite, because you had a number that were fantastic, some I'd never seen before, 
But when I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy, I had to memorize one of the first general orders issued oh, yeah. by George Washington on August 3, 1776. He said, the general is sorry to be informed that the foolish and wicked practice of profane cursing and swearing, <laughs> a vice heretofore little known in our American army, is growing in fashion. He later said that we can have no hope of the blessing of heaven understanding that our providence comes from heaven itself, God, unless we, uh, we stop insulting the Lord with our impiety. Well, and I'm glad you, you raised that point because it illustrates where we are today. If, let's say, the Chairman of the Joint State Chiefs of Staffs today were to issue that statement, oh. All hell would break loose, and he would, would probably have to resign. Well, here's a question I have for you. Obviously, since 1980, uh, when you founded Lamb and Lion Ministries, you've been warning America to turn back from its wicked ways. Yeah. You touch on your your trip to Russia, and you came yeah. home and said, "We are down the road if we're not careful toward That's spiritual right. oblivion." But all those spiritual disasters have been growing and growing. What motivated you to write this book now? Because I felt like we had reached the point of no return. Now that is something that disturbs a lot of people, particularly Christians, because they believe there is no such thing. But there is. Uh, if you study the Bible and how God deals with nations, there is a point of no return. The Bible refers to it, the point at which the wound becomes incurable. And it's a term that's used over and over with regard to nations in rebellion against God. Uh, actually Judah reached the point in its rebellion against God where God told Jeremiah not to pray for it. Yes. He told uh, Ezekiel not to pray for it. He said, your prayers will, will not have any, uh, any effect whatsoever because they've passed this point. They, the wound has become incurable. And I felt like we had reached that point. You know, I'm, I point out in the book that back in 1974 one of God's prophetic voices to this nation was Dave Wilkerson. God raised up a whole group in, in yeah. the mid-70s. And Dave Wilkerson was one. And in, he ended his book called The Vision by saying, that he felt like we had reached the point of no return. And I underlined that in red and put a question mark after it. In fact, I have it there in the book because I, I felt like that was extreme. Looking back on it now, I'm not so sure it was right. because we have been going downhill ever since then. God gave us the administration of Ronald Reagan and, and things began to turn around. But the moment Reagan left office, we got on the slide down. In fact, the very person who succeeded him, George H.W. Bush, came into office salivating over the New World Order and how we had to give up nationalism and become a part of the New World Order. Which, which is just a whole part of the end time Antichrist scheme. Hmm. And so I think we've been going downhill and it's ex it has accelerated since 2000. Uh, just unbelievably accelerated. And so in the book I give a lot of examples of this. And one, I, I, basically the two points I make is uh, well, basically the one point that I make in this book over and over from beginning to end is that our nation is in serious trouble because of one thing, we have forgotten God. Back in the 70's one of those prophets God raised up was Alexander Solzhenitsyn from Russia who came over here and said, let me tell you, you are on the same track that we were when I ask the older folks in our nation, why did we go into 70 years of communism and suffer as we did, they all gave the same answer, men forgot God. He said, America has forgotten God, and America has forgotten God. We are the most blessed nation in the history of mankind, and yet we have turned our back on God, we're snubbing our nose at God, we are, we are to the point where, you know, in the past we, we've had periods where we grew cold in God. We grew cold in our relationship toward God. And there were great periods of, of uh, revival that came when people began to pray earnestly that, that God would anoint our nation again. But I don't think that's possible now because I don't think we are cold in God. I think we are in outright rebellion against God, shaking our fist at God. When you have a major member of the Congress, a representative from New York who is yeah. chairman of the Judiciary Committee, make the statement, we don't care what any God has to say. I mean, we are in deep trouble. Jerry Nadler is one yeah, that said Jerry that. Nadler, that's terrible. right. Yes, sir. Well, Dave, some of the other examples that you gave in there were just really compelling to me. Can you give us some of the more dramatic ones that you believe show that the United States is trying to basically commit suicide? Well, I give a whole list. Uh, for example, I talk about the fact that I can see this because of my age. 
I can see this better than most people today. Because Which is I would, true. Because when you talk about the subject, I mean, I was born in the 70s, and it always seems like we were in a moral country. But you remember a time period. Oh, no. Of, I, of, I can remember a time when this yeah. was truly a Christian nation. Okay. I was born in 1938. I'm, I'm 83 years old. I can look back and I can see uh, when I was growing up where you went to church, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, you had three, crew, three or four crusades a year, vacation Bible school, church was your life. I, well, we didn't have television. Uh, so, uh, and I would dare say it wasn't just your experience, our leaders back oh, in those absolutely. days. absolutely. You can Ab point to Franklin Delano Roosevelt who had a long prayer or, or they, the they, very day of the invasion of yeah, Europe on yeah. the, the beaches of Normandy. In six and a half minutes. Exactly. And today a president that would do that would be run out of office. And yes. so well, the leaders reflect the morality of our land. You know, when I talk to young people today and tell them about when I was growing up what American society was like, everything was closed on Sunday except for the most essential things like service stations and pharmacies. Everything was closed. Um, people respected the, uh, the Lord. They respected Sundays. Uh, things, uh, 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 putting a, a game of the uh, National Football League on, on Sunday was just unthinkable. Even Wednesday nights were protected because they knew two people went to church on Wednesday night. And it goes on and on and on. You know, I, I can remember, I give a whole list in here of things that have changed. And one of them is the vulgarity in American society. And, and uh, the fact that when Gone with the Wind was released in 1939, it was held up for three months. Three months because it had the word damn in it at the end. And that was a violation of the code. Well, there are no codes today. No. And uh, I, I point out that a, a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio had the F word in it over 500 times in, in, in an hour and a half. That's how, we, how far we've gone. And one of the things I point out is, is schools. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, you look at education and you can see uh, the difference. I give them uh, uh, in this book the top public school discipline problems of the mid-1940s and the mid-1980s. Forty years apart, this same poll conducted in the state of California by the Education Department and the Fullerton Police Department. And in 1940, the major uh, problems were talking, chewing gum, making noise, running in the halls, getting out of turn in line, wearing improper clothing, and not putting paper in wastebaskets. And I can remember that. That's what we used to get punished for. Mid-1980s, Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery, and assault is probably a hundred times worse today. Oh yeah, I remember that growing up. Now they've added homosexuality and transsexualism and all and that. And it's yeah. happened so rapidly. Listen, in the 1950s our Congress added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance and our Congress uh, it did a, a, a whole a lot of things like that re, re, uh, with respect to putting God into American life, the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, all of these things they passed in the 1950s. Today, it would be if somebody got up and said, Well, we want to put under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, they'd be laughed out of Congress. You know, around the world this is happening. We were talking oh, yeah. just recently how there's a pastor in Canada who's in jail for proclaiming Christian truth. There is a member of parliament in Finland who is being prosecuted as we speak because she has adhered to biblical truth and right. the, the national prosecutors are even citing the Bible as a hate speech, right. just taking it in context. And, and yet it's that coming, is coming here. It's here. coming here. Yes, sir. So, the progressives what are some... would love to pass legislation right now that would make it a hate speech crime and put you in jail for saying that abortion is wrong or that homosexuality well, is wrong. Oh, they're trying to do that. As a matter of right. fact, that is what the, the legislation at the national level is that Congress, under Democratic control, has already passed, which would outlaw religious speech. Regardless of what the Constitution says, it would make the, the newfound sexual freedoms. Paramount even to it's our already true in Canada. Freedom. I yes. mean, in Canada, if, if we were if on this program, if we were broadcasting in Canada, and we mentioned that we were opposed to abortion or same-sex marriage, they would give us a warning. You do that one more time, it'll be a fifty thousand dollar fine, and yes. you'll be cut off television. Yes, it's wow. coming here. Oh it's coming. Goodness. Well, when we talk about judgment is coming on page one twenty-four, you list <clears> fifth, uh, five different types of wrath. I didn't know there were so many different kinds. Could you tell us a little about what each one of them are and how you see that affecting America? Okay, what page were you referring? One twenty-four. It starts with consequential yeah. wrath and yeah. cataclysmic. Well, uh, consequential wrath is the wrath we're most familiar with. I mean, if if you oh. become an alcoholic and 
and it ruins your family and you lose your job and it ruins your health, that's consequential wrath. It's, it's, a, it's the kind that people often refer to, refer to as sowing and reaping wrath. You, you reap what you sow. There's cataclysmic wrath. That's uh, in disasters, either man-made or natural disasters like the 9-11 or uh, Hurricane Katrina. And these are what I refer to as, as a remedial judgments. God will allow these from time to time to call us back to Him, to call us back to His Word, to call us to repentance. And then there's abandonment wrath. Abandonment wrath is where God simply lifts His Spirit. Uh, it can e- either be a nation or an individual. The greatest example of an individual is Samson, yes. who was anointed by God, and yet he reached the point in his his sexual obsessions where God raised his, uh, his uh, uh, anointing, and uh, Samson ended up committing suicide. Uh, but it can happen with a nation as well, that God can lift His uh, anointing, He can lift His uh, blessing, and abandon them uh, to a wrath. This is what Romans 1 is all about, how God steps back and allows wrath to simply, uh, he, he just, he, he basically says to the nation, you want to live in a foul nest? Okay, you can live in a foul nest. I'm going to lower my hedge of protection, I'm going to let evil multiply, and it begins to multiply. And I believe that's where we are. Okay. We are in under God's abandonment wrath right now. He loves this nation. He's blessed this nation more than any other nation. But He says in Romans 1, if the nation rebels, a nation that I have greatly blessed, I will step back. And He says the first thing that will happen, the very first thing will be a sexual revolution, which occurred in this country in the 1960s with the hippie movement, free love, and all that sort of thing. Then he says, if you refuse to repent, I'll step back a second time, and there will be another outcome of that, and that will be a plague of homosexuality. Mm. That's why I wrote an article for our magazine yes. at one time pointing out that homosexuality is not only a sin, but can also be a plague. It can be a divine judgment where God allows it to multiply. And we're seeing this all over the place today. Young people thinking it's cool to be bisexual or whatever because everybody else is. And it's just multiplying into a plague. And it says then if if, if uh if the nation refuses to repent, God will step back a third time, and the third time will be uh, an outbreak of, of insanity, basically, is what I would call it. He says he will, dece- yes. he will turn the nation over to a depraved mind. You know, Jeff Kinley, Jeff Kinley, a great Bible prophecy uh, teacher. In fact, you, we've had him on this program several times. Yes. I heard him recently speak. He says, you know, deceived people don't know that they are deceived uh-huh. because they're deceived. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> and and this is where we are right now. This nation has been turned over to depraved minds. And in this, I give you a long list of the kinds of things that progressives are proposing at, in Congress today. They're unbelievable things, like the legalization of pedophile with consenting children. With well, the government supporting That's the depraved crack minds. Pipes. We have had so much depravity descend upon our nation, and I think you've clearly documented how it is accelerating just in the last few years. But we're going to take a brief break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the hope that is inherent even in a message like this. My latest book is titled America's Suicide, and that's a rather radical, radical title, but I gave it that on purpose to catch people's attention, and I mean it seriously. Our nation is in the process of committing suicide. And the reason I point out in the book is because we have forgotten God. Our fundamental problem in this nation is not systemic racism. It is systemic godlessness. We are uh, shaking our fist at God today saying, who are you to tell us what to do? We are retreating to the times and the period of the judges in the Bible when every man did whatever he thought was right. And the result was anarchy. I end the book with hope. I talk about the fact, first of all, and most important of all, that it is a sign that we are living in the season of the Lord's return because all the end time prophecies talk about the fact that society will disintegrate to the point where it's consumed with violence and immorality. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our conversation with Dr. David Reagan regarding his tremendous book, America's suicide. Well, Dave, you already touched on the message that God gave to Jeremiah and Ezekiel about how He did not want them to even pray for their nation because they were so far gone. We haven't been given that command yet that we should not pray for our nation. So, indeed, we should. But, But really, even inherent in a message like this, 
there's tremendous hope. What, what is the hope that we point to? Well, the first thing that I would point out to is the fact that the Bible tells us over and over again that in the end times, right before the return of Jesus, society will become as evil, immoral, and violent as it was in the days of Noah. And we are witnessing that before our very eyes. It's one of the most important signs that we are living in the season of the Lord's return, and that gives hope because. To Christians it does. It yes. gives great hope. Uh, another thing is that uh, we uh, have always got individual hope. Whereas the nation may not have hope, we as believers have overwhelming hope. We have the hope of the rapture of the church, which will occur before the tribulation begins. Uh, we have the hope of of uh, being with the Lord during the millennium and reigning with Him and living in a world for a thousand years uh, where there is perfect peace, righteousness, and justice. I can hardly wait. Yeah. And then we have the hope of eternity with the Lord on a new earth, a refreshed earth, a redeemed earth, in glorified bodies where there's no longer any aches and pains, and <laughs> where we will be with the Lord in, the, in, in, in His presence. I can't wait. So, sort of like Dr. Al Mohler said on one of our Prophetic Voices episodes, Christians are not optimists and we're not pessimists. We are people of hope. Yes, and we're realists as well. Yes, we are. We are. We. Uh, but I, we have such great hope, and I really try to emphasize that at the end of the book. But it's only for those who have put their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For those who have not put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, they just don't really have any hope. I mean, the, the hope that the, what the Bible says lies ahead in the tribulation, the Antichrist, and all this, it is horrible. Uh, and, and often I have so many people who respond to me, well, I'm a good person, you know, I, I think I, I, I will go to heaven because I've tried to live a good life a whole lot better than the guy that lives down the street from me. Well, of course, we can always find somebody uh, like that. But God doesn't grave, grade on the curve. No. And, and recently when I was out in Santa Fe I went to the Calvary Chapel out there on Sunday and we heard a, a, a sermon by Skip Heitzig uh, of Albuquerque uh, who is a great Bible prophecy teacher. And he made a comment that really uh, impressed me. He said, folks, good people do not go to Heaven. Saved people go to Heaven. So, if you're living on uh, thinking you're going to make it on the basis of being good works or whatever, you're not going to make it. No. Because God doesn't grade on the curve. It depends on whether you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I love what you said too about the Millennial Kingdom that I think we forget as Christians that we're dual citizens. We mm -hmm. might be citizens of our country here, but we're really citizens of the country it is to come. And we forget that. And so, you as we are kind of strangers in a strange land now, we don't recognize the country we live in. I love on page 146, you give us five uh, reasons that, that things that Christians should be doing now yes. to keep holding evil back and change society. Right. Could you list those for us? Well, one of those things is to stand for righteousness. Yes. Jesus says we're to be salt and light. Uh -huh. And uh, if we aren't, nobody will be. And that doesn't mean that you have to be out there on the, on the front lines on every issue. And there's so many today. Uh, it, pray that God will lay an issue on your heart, and He will. Uh, it may be that He will give you a, a tremendous heart for aborted children, or it may be He'll give you a heart for homosexuals who are dealing with uh, uh, gender identity and, and that sort of thing. He may give you a heart for something else that's going on in our society. Whatever He gives you a heart for, then ask Him number two, what do you want me to do about it? It may be that He wants you on the front lines. It may be that He wants you to write letters to the editor. He may want you to run for office. Uh, th there's different things that He will ask different people to do. He doesn't ask everybody to do the same thing. But ask Him for an issue and ask Him what you are to do about it so that you can stand for, for righteousness in a society that has just completely decayed and could, could care less about righteousness. Another thing is to pray for courage because we all need courage. It's so easy to give in. What I see is happening in the church today is that churches all over this nation, certainly all the liberal churches, but even conservative churches, are deciding it's just easier to get in bed with the world and kind of go along rather than stand and what, for what the Bible says and know that you're going to be criticized. Uh, yesterday I was reading an article about uh, the Gaines uh, couple that flip houses. Keep and they, and in this article the guy said, it's just horrible when we discover that they attend a church where the preacher speaks against abortion and against same-sex marriage said such people shouldn't be on television. Well, all of us are going to experience this in our jobs, whether you're a t school teacher or whatever you are. 
people are going to come against you more and more and more about the fact that you're wearing a cross or you've uh-huh. said, God bless you. I, there was a lady in Kentucky who was hired, uh, fired a few years ago from her job as a bank teller because she said to the lady, God bless you. The lady yes. went to the ba- bank press says, that insulted me. It sounded like something Christian. And she lost her job over it. It's, it's just unbelievable. So, pray for courage. Commit yourself to holiness. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> I always say, take a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle, and on this side put all your activities. On this side say, is Jesus Lord of my what I eat? Is He Lord of what I go uh, see at the movies? Is He Lord of my music? Is He Lord of my vacation time? Is He Lord of anything? That's what holiness is all about on a practical basis, making Jesus Lord of everything in your life. Mm. Share the gospel. Share it with as many people as you can, as quickly yes. as you can, because we're living on borrowed time. And then put your trust in Jesus in everything. Put your trust in Jesus. Those are things that we can literally do in this end times when the whole world is turning against us. And if you don't believe that, just go to Google and type in the word Christianity and look at the articles that come up. Full of hatred. Type the name Franklin Graham. Look at the articles. Pray for him because this man could be assassinated any day. This is the situation that we're in in America today. It's that love, Antichrist spirit rising. Yeah. It certainly is. I love what you said about stand. I used to, in the legislature, remind people of Margaret Thatcher's advice, which was simply don't go wobbly. That's a British <laughs> phrase for stand. And one of my favorite movie scenes is Braveheart when William Wallace portrayed in the movie was trying to convince his soldiers not to flee from the battlefield even though the enemy was Ugh. charging toward them. And he said stand. Uh-huh. As Christians right now sometimes we simply have to stand on the rock, on the Word of God Amen. Amen. and don't go wobbly. Well, Dave, our viewers today will be very curious to know, what's your next project? What book are you working on right now that's going to bless us in the months to come? Well, I'm not working on one right now because I just finished one. I just oh, okay. Okay. I literally just went to the publisher, and when it'll come out, I don't know, because all across this nation, publishers are holding up books because they can't get paper. It's sitting in ships off the coast. But uh, the, the book uh, that I just finished is entitled... <laughs> What's the difference in a millennium and a millipede? <laughs> and the reason I titled it that is because over the years, of 41 years of holding conferences, I've had so many people come up and they were enraged about something or another uh, concerning Bible prophecy. And after talking to them about two or three minutes, you realize that they knew absolutely nothing about Bible prophecy. And I always wanted to say, do you know the difference in a millennium and a millipede? I never did it. I wanted to, but I never did it. So, now you've written a book with that so title. So, I did yeah. a book with that uh. title. And it's, it's, it's a basic book designed for the person in the pew, as all my books are. And, and this one simply talks about the fundamental viewpoints of historic premillennialism, uh, amillennialism, postmillennialism, modern uh, millennialism, uh, 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 premillennialism, and a fifth one. And the fifth one it talks about is the one that really is probably the most widespread, uh-huh. and that's panmillennialism. Pan oh, well, I'm yes, just mm-hmm. panmillennialist, it all pan out then. As I said the first time I heard that, I laughed at it. And since then, I've had to bite my tongue because I wanted to say to the pastor who says that to me, and that's what pastors say all the time in other words, you just admitted you're too lazy to study God's Word. Well, Dave, we know that your book is going to be a great blessing to our viewers. I hope that you will get a copy. Nathan and I have already read it, and it has blessed our hearts. So, even though the message for America is one of tremendous warning and gloom, the message that we share today is one of hope. And on that note, I hope that you'll join us next week for our next episode of Christ in Prophecy. Until then, look up, be watchful for our redemption. Our blessed hope, Jesus Christ, is drawing near. Godspeed. Thank you.